Good morning. Excited to be gathered here uh, today. What a special opportunity to get to participate in our kindergarten blessing today. And uh, we've got our college students back in town. Students, we're glad that you're here uh, today. Welcome to the gathering at Pioneer Drive. Uh, good time of year, right? Fall is mere days away. School is back and all the parents said? Amen, Amen right? We had colder weather this week. All the people said? Amen. Amen, right? And football season, we're on the cusp of football season. All the football fans said? Amen. Woo hoo. Absolutely. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, we're especially uh, glad that you're here and I uh, want to um, say that you picked a great Sunday to visit because we're actually starting a brand new series today. This is going uh, to be a, a deep dive into the book of First Thessalonians. This series is actually going to carry us all the way to Advent, all the way to the end of November. So uh, we're titling this series Everyday Faithfulness because that's kind of a, a summation of what you find in uh, that letter in 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul is, is writing to the church in Thessalonica. He's writing a letter of encouragement. And uh, he, despite what they're facing, he, he wants to encourage them to remain faithful to Christ. The message that you're gonna hear in this, in this letter is, though we will face difficult days, the love of Jesus is enough to sustain us. Let's press forward uh, in that faith to which we have been called. First Thessalonians has many wonderful truths for believers uh, living in any period. And I think our time together uh, in it over the, the next few months is going to be really rich and really inspiring. And I'm excited to join uh, with you in that journey as we embark on that today. We're consulting several great resources for this series, but one of the primary ones is a, a sermon series that was done at Bridgetown Church in 2015 called People of the Future. Uh, Bridgetown's a great church up there in Portland with a great pastor in John Mark Comer. And, and I just wanted to cite them on the front end as I'm sure a lot of what we'll be sharing in this series will be uh, taken from and adapted uh, by uh, what, they've, what they've provided. And so... Uh, before we jump into the text today, I wanna to provide a little bit of background to this letter. So instead of turning to 1 Thessalonians, uh, if you wanna follow along, you can turn to Acts chapter 17 with me. And that's where we'll be for uh, about the first half of this morning. And as you do that, I'll set the stage uh, for what we'll be reading. After Saul of Tarsus was convo converted on the road to Damascus and he became uh, who we know as the Apostle Paul, he began traveling uh, all over the Mediterranean preaching Jesus. And then one night, this event is recorded in, at the end of Acts chapter 16, says one night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia was this area in Northern Greece. So uh, Paul is converted near Damascus, which incidentally is right by ancient Abilene. If you see that uh, lower right-hand corner of the screen, Abilene is in the Bible. Luke chapter three, verse one, mentioned as one of the territories under the rule of Tiberius Caesar. Uh, anyway, Paul's converted near Damascus and he travels all over the ancient world preaching about Jesus. And, and then he has this vision of a man begging him to come and offer help in Macedonia. And Macedonia is in Northern Greece, is that very top left corner uh, of the map there. And so Macedonia, among other things, is known for being the original home of Alexander the Great, who lived a few hundred years before Jesus, uh, conquered most of the known world at that time, still today heralded as, heralded as one of the, the greatest military leaders in history. Well, around 315 BC, the king of Macedonia, a man named Cassander, was married to the half-sister of Alexander the Great. There won't be a quiz on this after, don't worry. Uh, but the woman that he was married to was the half-sister sister of Alexander the Great, and her name was Thessaloniki. So at the founding of a great city in Macedonia, uh, Cassander decided to name that city after his lovely wife. And so he called the city Thessaloniki. Today, we call it Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica is still one of the most prominent cities in all of Greece today. It is the second largest city in Greece. It's a port city. And so it was very important, very prominent uh, in, in those days, much like it is today. It was a hub of activity, commerce, art, philosophy, and religion were all in full force among the 100,000 or, 100, or so that, that lived uh, in Thessalonica and its region. And by New Testament times, Thessalonica was uh, steeped in rich history. It held a proud place among the, the cities of the ancient world and the Roman Empire, and it was loyal to Caesar. If you're taking notes today, you want to write that down. Thessalonica was loyal to Caesar. That is, a, that is an important Note. And so Paul receives a vision of this man in Macedonia saying, please come help us. 
And so he goes. He takes a couple of his closest companions with him, his co-worker Silas and his young protege, Timothy. And they set out from Troas, which uh, is on the, the western border of Asia right there. If you see the, the pink uh, area there on the map. And so they set out from Troas and uh, they sail across the Aegean. They get to Macedonia and they, the first place they stop is a town called Philippi. Uh, in Philippi, it's a place where they plant a church, a church to which Paul would later write a letter that we call today Philippians. And after they leave Philippi, they travel through Amphipolis and Apollonia. And the second stop is the bustling port city of Thessalonica. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 17, verse one. So when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. This was his custom. This is what he normally did when he entered a new town. He would find the Jewish synagogue and he would open the scriptures, the Old Testament, open the Jewish scriptures. And, and, uh, and, and from those scriptures, he would begin showing the fulfillment of so many prophecies in Jesus. He would show how the Ark of the Old Testament was leading to the arrival of Jesus and how Jesus is the long awaited promised Messiah. This is what he preached in Thessalonica. And some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. And so they drew a considerable number of people away from the synagogue. But the Jewish leaders uh, in Thessalonica, as you can imagine, didn't take too kindly to so many people being drawn away from, uh, from the Jewish faith, from the synagogue. And so in verse five, we read, but, after, but other Jews were jealous and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. And they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. And if you're like me, you're like, wait, who's Jason? He just got dropped in the middle of the story. We don't know anything about him. What's going on here? And, uh, and you know, my first thought was they rushed to Jason's. Okay, we get that. Like we're no strangers to rush, rushing to Jason's, right? There are plenty of Sundays after church, we rush to Jason's and why wouldn't we? That salad bar is killer, right? Uh, but they didn't have Jason's Deli in Macedonia at that time. So we gotta keep reading. So uh, they're looking for Paul and Silas at Jason's. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. So now we see that Jason was a local Christian in Thessalonica and that he had hosted Paul and Silas and Timothy in his home. And so Jason is dragged before the city officials. And there were three charges brought up at this meeting. The first charge is that uh, it's against Paul and Silas and Timothy is that they've caused trouble all over the world, whatever that means, right? It's pretty ambiguous and not really like a, a legitimate, like specific charge that you can really bring. Uh, it's more of, a, more of a slander, more of a rumor. There's nothing that you can actually uh, level against uh, somebody with that. And so it's really kind of uh, ambiguous, doesn't really carry much weight. The second charge is against Jason, that he has welcomed these troublemakers into his home. He has welcomed them into Thessalonica. And these two charges on their own probably weren't enough, you know, to evoke any sort of reaction from uh, the Thessalonian magistrates. Thessalonica, as we, uh, as we uh, talked about earlier, was a religious hub. It, it was a pluralistic sort of society. Many different gods, many different religions were recognized in Thessalonica. Uh, the, the city officials wouldn't really care if a Christian church was founded. It would just be one among many different religion and, uh, and, and houses of faith. And, and, and so uh, it's really the third charge that no doubt perked up everyone's ears. The third charge that evoked such a reaction from the magistrates as it did. And this is the third charge. And they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. The first two charges, no one really cared. But when they heard this, the city officials were thrown 
into turmoil. Remember, one of the, the characteristics of Thessalonica is that it was loyal to Caesar. It had a close relationship with Rome, and that was a big part of why it was so prosperous. For a city in the Roman Empire to thrive, it needed to be in good standing with Caesar. And so for any group to defy Caesar, even worse, to say that there is another king equal to Caesar or even greater than Caesar is not something that the Thessalonian magistrates would be able to abide. So they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. So the bond that Jason was required to pay was likely a sum that would be placed in a deposit that would be forfeited if he was ever seen with these troublemakers again. And so we infer from this that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were banned from the city. And well, they continue uh, traveling south through Greece and then uh, after stops in Berea and Athens, they eventually find themselves in Corinth. So they, uh, they spent three weeks preaching Jesus in Thessalonica. They were run out of town and that now they've been traveling south for a few months. But Paul starts to worry about the Christians in Thessalonica. He starts to, 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 to get concerned because he had to leave them so quickly after their conversion. He knows that they'll be facing a lot of social pressure. He knows that they may have to deal with false teachers, that there are gonna be different things that come up, maybe even persecution. So Paul's concerned that, that these Thessalonian Christians might be led astray or, or might fall away from the faith for, for one reason or another. You know, he had to leave them uh, so quickly. And, and when they were forced to flee Thessalonica, what Paul, Silas, and Timothy left behind was a new church with new Christians. They had been converted, but they hadn't been discipled. And I, I wonder you know, throughout the history of the church and even into today, how many believers across the various traditions and denominations that make up the global church, how many have been left converted, but not discipled? Even in recent history and sometimes and in some places, there, uh, there were those who became so heavily focused on what was called soul winning, that evangelism became not only the highest priority, but the only priority. And after uh, a sinner's prayer and a baptism was, uh, was evoked, you know, the search would continue for the next lost soul. But how many in the wake of zealous evangelism have been left converted, but not discipled? We see here in the heart of the Apostle Paul, the heart of a pastor, the heart of one who is not content with conversions and baptisms alone, but knows that discipleship is a necessity in the Christian life. And at Pioneer Drive, it's our heart as well that discipleship, spiritual formation, and the way of Jesus be primary in our lives. It's our prayer that there would be no one among us who could be said to have been shown the way to Jesus, but never taught to love him. One of our values here is nurturing deep spiritual roots that with integrity, we will cultivate a life formed by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Scriptures, built on a firm foundation, continuing our legacy of faith. At Pioneer Drive, we do this very, very well. Uh, the percentage of our people that attend Sunday, uh, Sunday school or a midweek small group relative to how many people are on our campus on a Sunday morning is upwards of 90%. And that may not sound like a big deal, uh, but it far exceeds the case in most churches. And it's a testament to the legacy of faith here and the priority that you make of discipleship in your own life, in your spouse's life, in your children's lives, and the value that we place on discipleship, not only for our own good, but for the good of our neighbors and for the good of our community. And I wanna encourage you this morning, if you aren't plugged into a Sunday school class or a small group to take that step today. You know, to have a group of people within the church, a, a family that, that knows you by name, that, that is invested in your well-being, that prays for you specifically and, and encourages you directly and challenges you in love and walks beside you in every season of life, that is such a grace from God. And so if you're looking for a Sunday school class or a small group, you can uh, find out more information by emailing our discipleship pastor, Jeff Scott at jscott at pioneerdrive.org. You can also visit the big blue wall after the service and we'd be more than happy to, to help you plug in. We're passionate about discipleship at Pioneer Drive. Christ himself said in the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very 
end of the age. Evangelism and discipleship are of equal importance in the kingdom of God. They are two sides of the same coin, and they are the two pillars on which the mission of the church rests. Paul knew this, and he knew evangelism had happened in Thessalonica, but he was concerned that the people had been left converted, but not discipled. And so when he can't stand it anymore, he sends Timothy up to go and check on them. And Timothy travels from from Corinth all the way back up to Thessalonica, and he spends some amount of time with the Thessalonians. We don't know exactly how long, maybe a couple of weeks. He spends some time with them. And then he brings a report back to Paul that's better than than anyone could have hoped for. Not only are the Thessalonians okay, they're thriving. They're growing in number and maturity and and they are facing a lot of pressure. They have had to deal with false teachers, you know, but this church has far exceeded anyone's most hopeful expectations. They're not without their problems, but they are doing very, very well. And Paul is overjoyed with this news. He's so overjoyed that he decides to write them a letter. And 2000 years later, we still have that letter. We call it 1 Thessalonians. Now let's open up that letter together now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We hear in the first three verses, the affection that Paul and his companions felt for the Thessalonian church. You know, we continually mention you in our prayers. We always thank God for all of you. And and then he goes on to to list the virtues that, that they see in them, the virtues for which they are thankful. He says, we remember your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope. Paul remembers that the Thessalonians were a people whose faith had produced work in their lives. I find this interesting because, you know, sometimes Paul is thought to contradict James. If you remember the book of James, it claims that faith without works is dead. Sometimes Paul is thought to, to contradict that. And you now it is important to, uh, to make a distinction here, but, but while Paul does write extensively in other places about justification being by faith alone, and, and he speaks against works of the law, it's an important distinction to make between work and works because uh, no works of the law can save you. And we see that uh, right here, that true faith produces work. It's not the other way around. And so uh, works can't save you keeping all the religious laws and the statutes can't save you. Only faith in Jesus Christ can save you. But true faith will produce work. It will show itself through action, the family of God doing each, uh, each doing their own part. You know, we just finished a two week series on serving uh, in the church. This is what Paul is commending the Thessalonians on here. Their, their faith produced a lifestyle of work, of serving, of being a part of what God was doing among them, contributing and not just consuming. If you haven't found your team or committed to a serving role at Pioneer Drive, let me encourage you to take that step today. You can do that by scanning the QR code there on the screen. Feel free to go ahead and do that right now. Or you can fill out the green card in the seat back pocket in front of you bring it to the big blue wall after the service. We'd love to help you plug in. Paul tells the Thessalonians, we remember your work produced by faith. He also says, we remember your labor prompted by love. And while there's not much of a distinction uh, on the surface there, you know, work and labor sound like pretty much the same thing to me, uh, but we'll see later in this letter that Paul is really speaking of the kind of community building care born out of the love of God, rooting itself in the hearts of God's people. Love for one another, love for your neighbors, love for your community, love for your enemies, and certainly love for God himself. Love in Paul's language was not a feeling or a state of mind. It was the result of God's presence and influence on humankind. As New Testament professor Victor Paul Furnish puts it, It says, for Paul, love is the necessary manifestation within Christ's body 
of the new creation already underway in the working of God's spirit. The new creation already underway. I love that. Finally, Paul says, we remember your endurance inspired by hope. Hope is a central theme in 1 Thessalonians. We're gonna see it come up again and again and again. This is the first time it makes an appearance. Hope. Notice that in the Bible, endurance is not a skill. Notice that it, that it is not a, a product of, of training or meditation or willpower, but rather Paul writes that, that this endurance is rooted in a whole new worldview. It's, it's rooted in a new perspective on life and eternity, one that could only be attained through hope and a hope that's rooted in our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse four, Paul writes, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. This is the high point of the introduction. Paul has commended the Thessalonians for the, the faith that they uh, displayed, for the fruit that they've already produced uh, as a church. And this is the culmination of the praise. He says, we know that you've been chosen by God. How does he know that? Because the gospel came to them with power. The Holy Spirit moved among them and produced a deep conviction in their lives. What higher commendation could be spoken about a church, but that the gospel has rooted in them in power. The Holy Spirit has moved among them and there has been produced in them a deep conviction for God. May it be so for Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. What a beautiful beginning to this letter. As we start this series together today, I wanna to encourage you to do something this week. Let's all take the time this week to read 1 Thessalonians in one sitting. It's a shorter letter. It's only five chapters. It takes even the slowest readers like me only about 30 minutes to read. Take the time to do that this week. Really meditate on the, the themes that you see coming through in that letter. Listen for how the Holy Spirit might want to speak to you through that letter and through this series. And then as you read, take notice of the ways that Paul encourages the Thessalonian church. This is primary, primarily a letter of encouragement. So take notice of how Paul encourages them. And then after your reading, take the note card that you got when you came in today. And if you didn't get one, we have more on the way out, but take that note card and write your own letter of encouragement to Pioneer Drive. Take the opportunity to thank God for the ways that he has blessed you through our church family. And then if you're willing, Share your note, maybe read it in your Sunday school class or small group, maybe share it with family and friends around the dinner table, maybe mail it to the church office. We'd love to, to read those notes. First Thessalonians is primarily a letter of encouragement to that church. So what better way to start this series than by writing our own letters of encouragement to our church? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the story of Paul and Silas and Timothy and the founding of the Thessalonian church. We thank you for the truths that we find there and what we see in the heart of the apostle Paul, that concern for discipleship. God, we pray that there would be no one among us who would be converted, but not discipled. God, help us to be a community like the Thessalonian church. Help us to have a faith that produces a lifestyle of work and service. Help us to move forward in our labors with one another and with our community and with our world. God, help that be born out of love for you and the love that you've put in our own hearts. And I pray, God, that you would give us that perspective, that special worldview of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that produces endurance. God, there've been some hard days lately. It's been a hard couple of years for most of us, for all of us. 
We need endurance. We confess it's not a human skill, but that it comes through a perspective, it comes through hope. And you help us cling to that hope, even through difficult days. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.